So firstly, good evening to everyone present here today at our fifth journal club from Pan India. So I'm Dr. Sindhura, Dr. Certified Nutritionist, Ambassador of Pan India and President of Journal Club Team Pan India. So uh, today's journal club topic is, is on plant-based diet and hypertension. So let me share the screen. I hope my screen is visible. So I'll be starting up. So today's uh, general club topic is plant-based diets, uh, how they help in reducing the blood pressure. It's a systematic review that we'll be uh, covering today. So uh, let me take you through the roadmap of uh, this uh, today's general club. So first, uh, the introduction, the panel introduction, as well as a study introduction will be done by me, that is Dr. Sindhura. Then methodology and results will be done by Dr. Melinda. And the discussion will be done by Deshna, Dr. Nitesh, and Dr. Pritam. And conclusion will be done by me. Okay. Uh, so let's continue with the panel introduction. So firstly, prevention is better than cure is always the fundamental principle of PAN organization. So it's working towards an approach to build a network globally and nationally to improve the nutritional system with the power of right dietary choices that can help in preventing diseases. So the change is always contradicted and PAN team is working rigorously to appeal through evidence-based guidance. So PAN... Uh, PAN does facilitate, facilitate integration of evidence-based nutrition into the core healthcare by empowering healthcare professionals and facilitate evidence-based nutrition education in med schools, as well as to provide guidance to the policymakers and the industry players. And uh, it also involves the international medical community in activities for furthering know-how on healthy eating environments and food systems. And it, PAN India also does increase knowledge integration and sustainability of programs and projects through partnerships and collaborations. And we we also create public awareness educating public through community programs like uh, pan india here uh, it was established in september of 2022 and we have been organizing a lot of polls quizzes journal clubs webinars discussion forums to disseminate information to wider groups especially through means of social media platforms like whatsapp linkedin instagram uh, conducting these webinars and all of those things um, so this is in short about PAN and uh, the mission of the PAN is uh, PAN India aims to be the catalyst in revolutionizing healthcare into a whole person care model with evidence-based nutrition, the core matrix. Our mission is to address the multitude of issues related to dietary choices of people in India by facilitating better healthcare systems, healthier and safer food environment and public awareness. And here we have our core strong international and national team. So, um, here you can see um, Dr. Allen Burke, who is the advisor to Pan India, Pan, in, uh, sorry, Pan International in Pan India. And we have Nicholas Openrider, MD co-founder and current chairman of the board at Pan International. And we have the strong dynamic leader, uh, the medical director of Pan India, Dr. Rajina Shaheen Ma'am. And uh, there is a strong medical pan team structure, including various doctors, nutritionists who contributes as program managers, ambassadors, volunteers, and also international team who are actively involved in various capacities. Doctors, faculties, or medicos who would like to get associated with pan can join us at various capacities like ambassadors, volunteers to help pass the mission forward. So this is in short about the pan introduction. So let me take you through the introduction of today's study. Just a second, please. I'm so sorry, just give me a second. There is some mishap in the um, merging of the presentation. So sorry about that.
Right. Coming to the introduction of today's study, first, before going into the details of the study, uh, let me uh, let me give you a little uh, briefing about the stats of the hypertension globally as well as nationally. So as we know, hypertension is the leading preventable risk factor and cause of cardiovascular disease and premature death worldwide. And hypertension is the number one risk factor for death globally affecting more than 1 billion people. And it accounts for about half of all heart disease and stroke related deaths worldwide. The prevalence of hypertension is rising globally owing to aging of the population and increases in exposure to lifestyle uh, risk factors, including unhealthy diets, which is one of the major risk factors. And prevalence of hypertension has increased, especially in low and middle income countries. And hypertension does not cause any symptoms on its own, which is why it's often referred to as the silent killer as well. If you see, uh, if we see the percentages of the um, hypertension related uh, deaths due to hypertension globally. So uh, these are the numbers. And hence, we can consider hypertension as a global epidemic as well. And if we uh, look at the global burden of hypertension, currently hypertension has affected around 1.3 billion adults. And one in four adults are affected with hypertension. And when it comes to uh, um, the hypertension under control, only one in five hypertensives were able to bring their hypertension or maintain their hypertension under control. And hypertension is the number one risk factor for death globally. So an estimated 1.28 billion, we are close to 1.3 billion adults aged in between 30 to 79 years worldwide have hypertension, which is mostly uh, two, uh, out of which mostly two thirds are living in low and middle income countries. And estimated 46% of adults with hypertension are unaware that they have the condition. And almost 700 million people are with untreated hypertension and less than half of adults, uh, that is around 42% with hypertension are diagnosed and treated. So the number of Adults aged uh, 30 to 79 years, as I've mentioned, in the adult age group, if we compare in the last 30 years, like from, for, for example, if we uh, see from 1990 to currently, in the past three decades, the number of hypertensives have almost doubled from 650 million to 1.28 billion. And one of the global targets for non-communicable disease is to reduce the prevalence of hypertension by 33% between 2010 and 20. Um, 2030. So uh, currently we have 1.3 billion people, close to 1.3 billion people with hypertension and one in five women have hypertension, one in four men have hypertension. So uh, why are we discussing this? Because we need to understand the depth um, of the hypertension as well so that we will definitely look out for the sustainable uh, sources or the solutions and among which the plant-based diet is one of the sustainable solution for controlling or managing hypertension. And also if you see the hypertension rates in high income countries, uh, the rates of hypertension is higher in men compared to women. When it comes to the lower income countries, whether it's men or women, it's almost the same. And you can also see the prevalence of hypertension around 90s and how it has progressed, uh, how readily it has progressed in 2019. This is in men and this is in women. And it is estimated that at least one in four adults in India has hypertension when it comes to the nationally. Uh, in, in our country, one in four adults have hypertension, but only 12% of them have their blood pressure un under control, which is very, very less. And uncontrolled blood pressure is one of the main risk factors for cardiovascular disease, such as heart attacks, stroke, and are responsible for one third of total deaths in India. And India has launched, uh, Government of India has launched a specific initiative called as IHCI, that is Indian Hypertension Control Initiative, where they are... Um, where they're fast-tracking access to treatment services for over 220 million people in India who have hypertension. And they've also set a target of 25% relative reduction in the prevalence of hypertension by 2025. And according to the NFH National Family Health Survey 5, which is done in, which is released in 2019 to 2020, they report a hypertension prevalence of 24% in men and 21% among women, which has increased from 19% and 17% respectively from previous uh, uh, survey, that is a National Family Health Survey 4. And this, you can see the prevalence of hypertension across states in India around 2015 to 2016. And uh, compared to the northern part of the India, the southern part of the India has um, higher rates of hypertension. 
And this is from the National Family Health Survey 5, uh, the prevalence of awareness on treatment people um, hypertensives under control. So according to the rule of half of hypertension, half of the people with high blood pressure are not known and half of these who are known are not treated and half of those who are treated are not controlled. And according to Comprehensive National Nutrition Survey 2 of all 29 states of India, the analysis shows an alarming prevalence of high BP in or hypertension in Indian youth, which is a more concerning thing again. So 35% of 10 to 12 year olds and 25% of 13 to 19 year olds had BP in the stage of one or uh, stage uh, hypertension one or hypertension two range. So one study reported that individuals from southern Indian states had higher BP or higher uh, rates of hypertension compared to those in the northern Indian states. And the prevalence of high BP may reflect currently a uh, current reality for Indian youth and obesity and metabolic obesity found in as many as 50% of anthropometrically undernourished and normal weight Indian children and adolescents are key drivers for hypertension again. And high BP was associated with overweight and obesity in this study and not unexpectedly, it's also, they are also associated with high levels of fasting blood glucose, triglycerides, high levels of LDL and this finding may reflect the direct effects of poor nutrition choices or inadequate physical activity. And also we can see uh, from, a, from a journal published in the Lancet, um, we can see the global attributable deaths from various risk factors in males, in females or in males. You can see in females, the highest contributor is high systolic blood pressure and also the dietary risk, the second highest. Likewise, in males, we can see the second highest is the higher hypertension and the third highest is the dietary risk again. So this emphasizes why we have to be looking out for um, sustainable uh, dietary patterns. And we, as we all know, uh, there are different risk factors for the hypertension out of which uh, increased consumption of salt is definitely one of the risk factors. But again, low intake of fruits and vegetables, increased sat fat and trans fat again, which is... Um, which is predominantly seen in uh, meat-based dietary patterns or animal-based dietary patterns compared to the plant-based dietary patterns. So uh, if you see like unhealthy diets, like a diet high in saturated fat, trans fat, low intake of fruits and vegetables, which is quite opposite to the plant-based diet, is putting the person at a risk of developing hypertension. And as we know, if left untreated hypertension can lead to severe health complications like heart failure, chronic kidney disease, coronary artery disease, peripheral arterial disease, stroke, and vascular dementia. So the current study, what we are dealing today is, or what we are discussing today is how plant-based diets help in reducing the blood pressure, which is a systematic review of recent evidence, which was published in May 2023. And the authors are uh, Tom Carnirio and Francisco Vision. And from this, the data concerning the intake of plant-based diet and their effects on blood pressure keep accumulating and there is consensus that plant-based diets are associated with lower blood pressure. So in this systematic review, we have summarized the latest data on plant-based diets and blood pressure with insights on the molecules, how the different molecules present in plant-based diet help in responsible for the described effects or lowering in the blood pressure. So the EPIC Oxford study included more than 10,000 British subjects and showed that vegans presented the lowest levels of hypertension tension and blood pressure, while meat-eating individuals presented the highest ones. Likewise, from another study, which is the most famous in the popular health study, that is Adventist Health Study Cohort, which is comprising of around 100,000 Adventists in North America, where vegans and vegetarians presented lower BP levels than the individuals eating meat. And coronary artery risk development in young adults cardia, a dose-dependent relationship was found between plant food intake, that is comprising of whole grains, fruits, vegetables, etc., and reduced incidence of raised BP. And again, when we talk about the consumption of plant-based diet, it has to be healthy full plant-based diet. So that is more important. That means consuming whole grains, legumes, fruits, vegetables, which are rich in dietary fiber and complex carbs is very, very important. So in the combined analysis of the nurses' health study and HS1 and 2 and the health professionals follow-up study, an association was found between hypertension and the consumption of meat and seafood. Just give me a second. So uh, the methodology and the results part will be dealt by uh, Dr. Melinda. Just a second, I'll be sharing the screen. Uh, hi everyone, this is Dr. Melinda over here. 
I will be uh, presenting today methodology and results. So coming to the first slide, uh, yeah. So you can see the search strategy for this uh, systemic review was done via Prisma guidelines, where we went through PubMed, uh, Web of Science, and Scopus. Now, if you see the next slide, where you can see the entire screening process. So initially, all the three, uh, that is the Scopus, Web of Science, and PubMed, uh, through which we collected the data. Out, uh, out of this, then we uh, underwent the screening process through which many articles were excluded. Now, the exclusion criteria included any conference, uh, any study which was just a conference paper or was it an ongoing study or uh, uh, the diet was not the main source of the interest. So out, uh, after exclusion, only 39 studies were included, which were reviewed as a table. Now, coming to the next slide. Now, you can see over here, out of the 39 studies, uh, they were uh, presented in a group, uh, tabulated form. Now, in this table, it has five parameters. First being the age and the number of participants involved. Second being the healthy and the pathological history of the subjects. Third was the study groups where different diets were given to the subject. Fourth was the study design and intervention period. And lastly, the results. Next slide, please. Uh, over here, you can see the entire table. If you, uh, I had just overviewed the entire thing where you can see the minimum age uh, of the study was three years and the maximum was 82 years. Coming to the pathological condition, which included were overweight, obese with metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular disease, rheumatoid arthritis, dyslipidemia, high blood pressure, chronic kidney disease, even HIV infection was included, type 1 and type 2 diabetes, risk of diabetes and pre-diabetics. Now, coming to the time course of the study, the minimum time study was of uh, three weeks and maximum was eight years. Different diets were used, uh, including Mediterranean diet, vegan diet, whole food plant-based diet, vegetarian diet, DASH diet, and also extra virgin uh, olive oil uh, supplemented diets. Come to the next slide. Now, over here, you can see the table where the five parameters are present. I'll be focusing mainly on the study group and the results. Uh, next. So you can see over here, uh, the highlighted parts of, uh, are the study, uh, study group with different diets and the results will be uh, on the other side, the last table. So you can see in the first one itself, Mediterranean diet and vegan diet. Both of them uh, 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 showed that uh, there was decrease in both systolic as well as diastolic BP. Mediterranean diet had more uh, decrease compared to the uh, vegan diet. Uh, Ma'am, uh, keep on pressing next. Again, enough. Now over here you can see, um, yeah, uh, the second the second study and the fourth study over here both were using Mediterranean diet. Whereas in the second study, you can see it was supplemented with extra virgin olive oil. And the last, uh, second last study, you can see it was complemented with extra virgin olive oil, tree nuts, or also with a low fat diet. All the three studies showed that there was decrease in both systolic as well as diastolic BP. Next. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, again, press next. Okay. Now over here, you can see uh, the second last and the last one. Now, in the second last study, you can see the intervention group over there was included, uh, was given a diet of uh, reduced fat intake up to 20% of total energy, increase in the vegetable diet, fruit intake to five servings per day, and an increase in grain intake to six servings per day. The uh, results were reduction in BP. Similarly, uh, the Mediterranean and low carbohydrate diet that also again showed uh, at the end of six months, significant decrease in uh, both diastolic as well as systolic blood pressure. Next. Um, yeah. So if you pay attention to this, any diet, so over here in this on top, the intervention group uh, was including meals with one half of plate consisting non-starchy vegetables, one quarter with lean protein, one quarter with low glycemic index carbohydrates, such as whole grains. Again, it showed significant decrease in blood pressure. Then you can see DASH group over here, where again, DASH diet also lead to improved in the BP measurements. Lastly, if you see the last study over here, where it shows low fat diet, restricted calorie diet, Mediterranean restricted calorie diet, and not restricted calorie diet. All of them 
all the food groups showed decrease in the systolic blood pressure and also small reductions in diastolic blood pressure. Um, next. Now, if I go on with all the diets, there will be significant decrease only if only and only if we are taking or uh, consuming plant-based diet. So I'll just go through the entire table to show you which are the studies which are showing decrease. So you can see over here again, vegetarian diet. Next, ma'am. Next. Now you can see the color change also over here. These are again the same, uh, like you can see over here, Mediterranean guy, uh, like almond supplemented Mediterranean diet, which again shows decrease in the systolic and diastolic blood, blood pressure. Ma'am, uh, yeah. Over here also it's the same thing. Uh, now you can see that 96 children won the third study, the third study over here, where plant-based diet uh, con uh, consisting of whole foods, including fruits, vegetables, beans, other legumes, whole grains, limited salt, all this again decreased blood pressure. Next slide, ma'am. Next slide. Okay. Uh, now over here, you can see the American Heart Association. Um, I'm just press next. So you can see over here, uh, this uh, dietary group of American Heart Association also showed decrease a significant decrease in uh, systolic as well as diastolic blood pressure. And uh, again, Mediterranean diet showed decrease in the blood pressure. So overall, I can summarize one thing is that it might be any type of plant-based food. It does not matter whether it is Mediterranean, vegan, vegetarian, whole-based plant diet or low-fat diet it will reduce blood pressure till the time it is plant-based. Mediterranean diet, now in this all the 39 studies, whenever there was Mediterranean diet, it showed maximum results in reducing blood pressure. And there was only one study which showed that low-fat diet had greater reductions compared to Mediterranean diet. With this, we can move forward to the conclusion. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Melinda. I think uh, Dr. Deshna can take over. Hello. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Um, yes, Deshna, you can continue. Yeah, yes, ma'am. I cannot see the picture. So now we'll look into the evidence of basically RCTs which are present. So the evidence is plentiful there. Uh, we are limiting it to 39 trials based on uh, plant-based diet as an exposure and BP or hypertension as outcome. The subject you used, uh, the subjects included were either overweight or obese subjects uh, with high risk of uh, cardiometabolic disease, example, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes mellitus, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, along with rheumatoid arthritis and chronic diseases chronic kidney diseases these all studies reinforce the conclusion uh, that were mentioned above next slide please so now we'll look into uh, 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 the other slide second slide now we'll look into the sub studies from Predimed and Predimed Plus trials, it confirms that a high adherence to the MED diet, that is a vegetarian diet consisting of high amounts of fruits and vegetables, is associated with lower blood pressure values. Non-treated participants following a MED diet showed less need for the use of antihypertensive drugs. Similarly, the MED diet adherence was associated with the decreased need of escalating antihypertensive therapy in the patients who were actually using uh, drugs at baseline. As for the PREDIMED plus trial at baseline, a tendency was found towards a lower MED diet adherence for participants with the highest validated MED severity score, that is metabolic se uh, se severity score, which is given on the basis of various uh, characteristics like BP, uh, triglycerides, HDL levels. And on that, people with higher severity score were found to be uh, less adherent to the MED diet. Next slide. Uh, and along with that, a high carbohydrate quality index showed a reduction in SBP and DPP, that is systolic and di diastolic blood pressure. Increased nut in, uh, consumption also improved the blood pressure, other factors such as physical activity, 
लो सेडेंटरी टाइम और लो डिप्रेशन रिस्क आल्सो कंट्रीब्यूटेड टू एनहांस द पॉजिटिव इफेक्ट्स ऑफ हाइप ऑन हाइपरटेंशन नाउ ऑन पर्टिकुलरली मेडिटेरियन डाइट there was a study which showed that adherence to a dietary pattern which was associated with favorable effects on bp in apparent apparently healthy individuals overweight or obese individuals and other individual with other conditions next slide now dash diet that is dietary approach to stop hypertension particularly which emphasizes intake of uh, fruits and vegetables along with lower intake of sodium levels that is salt so it was seen that it significant it was significantly associated with lower systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure in an acity uh, it was found that japanese cuisine based dash diet which was in accordance with the nutritional composition of the dash diet improved home measured bp and stabilizes stabilizes its variability compared to a group who consumed their usual diet another investigational study mimicking Uh, the other slide last slide man another uh, an investigational diet mimicking the average east asian diet but retaining the common characteristics of med and dash diet also produced positive effects next slide please so again these were the many studies which showed that a, a high adherence to a med diet and a plant based diet can help in uh maintaining or reducing uh, uh, systolic and uh, diastolic blood pressure and uh, uh, this one particular study showed that volunteers who had a 5 day fasting prior to following the modified dash diet showed a sustained reduction both in 24 hours ambulatory sbp and mean arterial blood pressure indeed subject undergoing fasting reduced this reduced their intake of antihypertensive medication in 43% of the cases whereas dash diet alone this happened in 17% of the cases next slide vegan or vegetarian diet specifically whole food plant based diet and avoidance of animal products is shown to have favorable effects on spp and dbp a low carbohydrate vegan diet high in canola oil and plant protein was compared to a vegetarian therapeutic diet in type 2 diabetes there was no changes in bp medication in and no treatment difference in blood pressure however within treatment significant reduction in spp and diastolic blood pressure was seen on low carbohydrate vegan and on the vegetarian diet next slide please other studies many studies showing med diet or traditionally uh, traditional diet jinganian dry diet and a controlled diet low in plants for 6 months showed significant decrease from baseline in spp and dpp for all diets but the difference between the groups were non significant there was a tendency to decrease diastolic blood pressure in fasting plus plant based diet another study having various type of uh, diets rich in plants also showed improvement in sbp and dpp next slide please so in in all uh, considering all these studies we can summarize that basically a diet with high amounts of whole plant foods consisting of vegetable grains legumes and fruits whether it be mediterranean diet whether it be dash diet or vegetarian diet a diet with high amount of vegetables grains legumes and fruits and avoidance of animal products can help to reduce blood pressure thank you so much now i would like to uh, invite dr nitesh to continue with his uh, discussion part thank you ma'am uh, hi everyone i am dr nitesh and uh, today i am going to present uh, evidence on effects of particular plant based diet uh, in regard to blood pressure outcomes so first vegetarian diet so generally a uh, vegetarian diet is uh, primarily consists of plant sources like grains vegetables fruits legumes nuts and seeds and uh, which is usually uh, does not include meat poultry and fish and uh, it subgroups the categories uh, include uh, vegan which are uh, exclusively plant based uh, uh, then uh, lacto vegetarian uh, which uh, use plant sources uh, with uh, dairy products and lacto vegetarians 
who eat uh, in addition to plant sources and dairy products eggs so here are some uh, meta analysis uh, on a vegetarian effects of vegetarian diet on blood pressure outcome so one meta analysis uh, where uh, <clears throat> there was uh, more than uh, uh, 20000 participants from 32 cross sectional studies the finding of this uh, meta analysis suggested that there was mean decrease in blood pressure in vegetarians compared to omnivores another meta analysis with uh, 187 participants uh, where the intervention diet was lacto vegetarian uh, and the finding suggested that the mean decrease in systolic blood pressure and uh, as well as diastolic blood pressure also observed uh, there was a meta analysis of uh, 15 rcts uh, done by lee kw et al uh, where intervention uh, diet was diets were lacto vegetarian diet and a vegan diet and uh, the comparator diet included omnivorous diet uh, the findings of this meta analysis suggested significant decrease in systolic as well as diastolic blood pressure in intervention group however uh, in subgroup analysis uh, superior results in vegan compared to lacto vegetarian uh, diet group observed uh, in contrary to <clears throat> all these meta analysis there was one meta analysis done by gib j etal of uh, nine control trials uh, which suggested non significant reduction in systolic as well as diastolic blood pressure however the reliability of result was low next slide so now dash diet which is also called as dietary approach to stop hypertension diet uh, which usually consists of uh, plant sources uh, which is uh, low <coughs> in a uh, low fat dairy and uh, limited in uh, lean, uh, lean meat so there was one uh, trial conducted uh, popularly known as a dash diet trial which was a eight week trial with three dietary patterns that is standard american diet uh, dash diet and fruit and vegetable diet uh, here i would like to mention that the fruit and vegetable uh, content of dash diet was uh, more compared to fruits and vegetable diet and uh, this uh, trial found that there was significant reduction in african americans as well as uh, already known hypertensive subjects after this uh, trial they also conducted a uh, dash sodium trial where <coughs> restraining of sodium was observed uh, the findings suggested that the sodium restraint was associated with a further decrease in blood pressure and higher bp levels at baseline associated with enhanced bp reduction uh, in addition to this okay in addition to this uh, uh, trials uh, finding from a recent meta analysis suggested that the dash diet was associated with decrease in systolic and diastolic blood pressure with high degree of certainty okay so now coming to mediterranean diet uh, which is usually consist of a uh, high intake of fruits vegetable grains nuts and olive oil uh, and a moderate intake of poultry seafood eggs and dairy products however uh, limited in uh, red and processed meat intake a meta analysis was conducted uh, uh, with a more prospective and cross sectional study and uh, 30000 participants and more than 6000 metabolic syndrome cases the findings of this meta analysis suggested that there was inverse significant association with high adherence to mediterranean diet with a relative risk of 0.87 and 95% confidence interval uh between 0 0.77 to 0 0.97 uh in addition to this meta analysis uh, <clears throat> several uh, rcts and uh, at least three meta analysis showed similar consistent result that is mediterranean diet associated with both reduction reduction in both systolic and diastolic blood pressure uh the healthy nordic diet which is usually observed in uh, northern european countries and uh, which is consists of whole grains, uh, legumes, rapeseed, and uh, fatty uh, fish, shellfish, seafood, and low-fat meat. 
and restricted in salt and sugar sweetened product intake. A meta analysis was conducted with uh, 420 participants from uh, three control trials, suggested that the healthy Nordic diet was associated with mean reduction in systolic as well as diastolic blood pressure with moderate certainty of results. Next slide. Okay. Uh, to addition to previous uh, diets, uh, uh, the author of this uh, meta analysis also reviewed uh, uh, other vegetarian patterns like uh, high fruit diets, vegetable high vegetable diets, uh, and uh, uh, high fiber diets. So, uh, from two meta analysis, uh, they found that uh, uh, there the one meta analysis which included a uh, high fruit diet and a uh, high vegetable diet as intervention diet, whereas another meta analysis which included intervention diet, uh, the high fiber diet. The Results of both these uh, meta-analysis suggested that there was reduction in uh, blood pressure. However, the certainty of evidences was extremely low in uh, in case of both the meta-analysis. The first umbrella review regarding plant-based diets and BP outcomes uh, was conducted by Dinu and uh, colleagues, uh, which included meta-analysis of RCTs assessing various categories of plant-based diets. So the findings of this uh, review suggested that the balanced dietary patterns favoring vegetable, fruits, whole grains, plant-based proteins, and uh, limiting sodium, sugar, and red and processed meat intake found to be beneficial in adverse cardiometabolic scenarios. They also found that uh, that uh, DASH diet and uh, Mediterranean diets uh, were associated uh, with the uh, most consistent results where there's Nordic and other vegetarian dietary patterns associated with weak evidences of beneficial effects. The author of this umbrella review also uh, encountered some limitations. According to them, uh, the this uh, there were limitations related to understanding, meaning, and applicability of findings in clinical practice. Uh, the majority of meta-analysis were uh, with low methodological quality and also with a reduced number of control trials. And finally, they also found that there was overall weak strength of evidence. So this is all about uh, evidence on effects of particular plant-based diets uh, in BP outcome. Now, I would like to request uh, Peter Mann uh, to continue the discussion further. Thank you, Dr. Nitesh. Uh, good evening, all. Uh, so I want thanks to our uh, team for briefing the introduction of this, uh, the blood pressure, the prevalence of the hypertension, and also the methodology, which uh, uh, then the results, which clearly uh, mention or the concludes that the predominant plant-based diets. Uh, so those are the one which helps or combat uh, helps in combating this hypertension. So we know that the plant-based are the ones, but what actually the what components helps in combating or what the mechanisms uh, that helps in combating this hypertension let us see uh, so here in this uh, article they have discussed few of the uh, the components so first is a vitamin c so vitamin c is an ascorbic acid is an essential micronutrient and it is a powerful aqueous phase antioxidant. So it's usually it restores the endothelial function in the patients uh, with the coronary artery diseases, also at risk factors. So what's actually the mechanism of action uh, of this uh, uh, ascorbic acid? It usually it stimulates the endothelium derived nitric oxide synthesis. So this endothelium derived nitric oxide, so this plays a pivotal role in uh, maintaining this vascular homeostasis. One is by inducing the smooth muscle relaxation. So, uh, and also inhibiting the, on the other side, it inhibiting the uh, platelet aggregation and cell proliferations. So we know that in our body, uh, the cells always, uh, the electrons, they accept the electrons and the delivery of the electrons will take place, uh, mainly to maintain the oxidative levels of the cells. So similarly here also this, uh, the uh, endothelial nitric oxide synthase, so that become impaired due to the loss of oxidation. Uh, that, that is the critical uh, or the crucial cofactor of that is the tetrahydrobiopterin and also the NADPH. So where 
so in this case, uh, where the vitamin C come to the picture or the dietary supplements of vitamin C, so which they are act as an antioxidant, right? So along with that, even some of the uh, thiol agents like glutathione, so they are also induce the antioxidant synthesis uh, in uh, vascular endo, uh, endothelial cells so that it could improve this uh, endothelium derived nitric oxide availability and so that it makes the vasco, uh, vasomotor functions. Okay. So along with this uh, uh, vitamin C, we have got the cellular uh, levels antioxidant, that is the glutathione. So that also play a major role in protecting uh, the damage uh, uh, from the damage, cell damages. So where uh, even uh, this vitamin C, it acts or uh, it does it mechanism without affecting this ratio, that is GSH, uh, the glutathione and the oxidized form of this uh, glutathione. So where this vitamin C, sometimes it supports or it synergizes with this glutathione so that it maintains the oxidative levels and also uh, it's by stimulating this uh, uh, endothelium, uh, endothelium derived nitric oxide so that it maintains the vascular function, smooth muscle relaxation, what I told. So let us see, next slide. So here comes the recommendation and the food sources. So approximately 70 to 90 percent of vitamin C is absorbed at a moderate intake, that is 30 to 180 milligram per day. So uh, the ICMR uh, have uh, given that recommended dietary allowance of, of this vitamin C is 80 milligram per day for the males, and wherein the females it is 65 milligram per day. So and also it varies uh, among the adults. Okay, and also the pregnancy and lactation and also the smoking, where the smoking it is actually more because there the oxidative stress is more. So that's why we need to take uh, more with the uh, beyond this uh, recommended dietary allowance that is 35 milligrams per day. And we can go uh, here are the food sources, even the picture we can see that we have got the citrus. Uh, yeah, these are the food sources, uh, citrus and that the oranges, kiwi, le uh, lemon grapefruits, bell peppers, strawberries, and the major one, uh, which, uh, this is uh, Gava and the Amla. They are having the rich source of vitamin C. So we can just take it in our daily life. So coming to the potassium. Uh, so potassium is the most abundant intracellular minerals. Uh, and also, uh, we know that its role in regulation, the BP is well established already. So it, one is it is important for the muscle function. And also it relaxes the walls of the blood vessels by lowering this blood pressure and also protecting against the muscle crampings. So uh, there are already number of studies that have shown uh, the association between how this, uh, uh, if we take the low potassium intake, uh, what is the risk factors, how the in, there is increase in the blood pressure and all. On the other side, uh, so by taking more uh, signif uh, this, uh, uh, potassium, there is significantly we can reduce the uh, blood pressure. So that's why we need to choose the healthy uh, foods. Uh, previous one only, my previous slide. So uh, where uh, this potassium, uh, the mechanism is it involves in the uh, stimulatory effects of uh, the potassium on the sodium potassium ATPase. So this sodium, it is a crucial enzyme that is found in the cell membrane and the blood vessel walls. But the main function here also, it's main, uh, it is to maintain the right balance of this potassium and the sodium inside the uh, cells. Okay, and also it leads to the hyperpolarization where uh, this enzyme that is what that is sodium potassium ATPase is there. That enzyme, uh, uh, generally to say that we know that the cell is uh, it in the inside the cell there is a sodium ions present. So this hyperpolarization what or this enzyme what does it do is it removes the sodium ions out of the cell and. Uh, let in the potassium inside the cell so that it makes a uh, where uh, the more uh, potassium ions are present inside the cells so that uh, is we call it as an, a hyperpolarization of the cells so this mechanism usually decreases the cytosolic calcium cal uh, concentration and also results in an uh, augmentation of vasomotion means uh, like uh, always there is a relation we know that relationship between this potassium and the calcium is tightly regulated 
So here also what uh, the cell, this uh, enzyme or this potassium, uh, so it uh, what does that do is generally it reduces the cytosolic calcium levels, okay, by, by uh, opening, there will be a less opening for these calcium channels. So that only a little amount of calcium ions get entered into the uh, cells. And finally, it shows a rhythmic contraction and relaxation of the blood vessels. So also this potassium uh, helps our kidney to get rid of the excess sodium. That is what uh, that uh, uh, the potassium has been suggested directly stimulates this one is the that is endothelium derived nitric oxide synthesis and also increases the natural uresis that is removing the excess sodium out of the kidney. And so the tendency without uh, to take back of the sodium from the urine. So next is uh, here is the recommendation and the uh, food sources. So one of the population, uh, one population study that is uh, in St. Lucia suggested that an increase in the dietary potassium uh, from only 20 to 30 millimole per day. So it's around 742,173 milligram per day that could result in uh, 2 to 3 mmHg reduction in the blood pressure. Systolic, uh, systolic blood pressure in the population. So that is the intersol uh, study where they have shown that, that the potassium intake is equivalent to an uh, increase of three servings of either the fruits or the vegetables per day. So while uh, the ICMR has recommended about uh, around uh, 3,510 milligrams per day, and also the DASH diet is a uh, famous diet for this uh, hypertension that has recommended around 4,700 milligrams potassium daily. Here also we can see that what are the food sources. Uh, there are the vegetables, fruits, banana, and also the potato, tomato, puree, and all. Those are the food sources. We need to choose it wisely. So coming to the polyphenols. Uh, so dietary polyphenols, they are uh, uh, derived into four main classes. One is the flavonoids, phenolic acids, and stilbens and the uh, lig uh, lignans. Uh, so stilbens is nothing but we usually uh, uh, notice in the wines or the grapes or the peanuts. That is what uh, uh, resveratrol. That also helps in uh, maintaining this. Uh, uh, these are the bioactive compounds which are present in the uh, these plant-based diets. Okay. So the dietary uh, phenolic compounds, they have the uh, protective role against this cardiovascular risk due to the numerous, they, they have got their numerous chemical and uh, structural properties and also the biological effects. So that in including the high antioxidant capacity, these all have been uh, done, the research, the in vitro as well as the in vivo study. And uh, they concluded or they reported that the, they have got the anti-inflammatory, anti-hypertensive and also uh, that helps in improved endothelial functions. So uh, the polyphenols usually that may not work directly as an antioxidant, but they helps in creating a healthy environment within the cells lining in the blood vessels. So that the polyphenols, uh, like they can uh, stimulate, okay, uh, this, uh, um, uh, the formation of this vasoprotective factors. Uh, such, as, such as the nitric oxide or the endothelium, as I told, the endothelium derived hyperpolarization factors. So these promotes the vasodilation and inhibit the platelet regulation and also improve the uh, smooth muscle relaxation or the smooth muscle functions. So, and uh, the polyphenols like in the foods like uh, tea, coffee, chocolate, or the beetroot juice that have shown an uh, improved flow mediated dilation. Flow mediated dilation is uh, one. Uh, it is one of the, uh, that is the measure of this endothelial function, uh, which is commonly used to see how healthy the blood vessel is. And also it enhances uh, these foods, okay, that enhances the uh, vasomotion, contributing into their potential hypotensive effects. So yeah, in this, actually, uh, we don't have uh, such a uh, regulatory recommendation currently for this consumption of polyphenols. Uh, uh, because this is not neither a vitamin nor this they have the recommended dietary intakes. So that's why uh, based on the uh, uh, research articles only, here the population study, which is from based from the uh, Brazil that have noted the uh, mean and the medium polyphenol intake of for the whole population was uh, 392.6 and 360.6 milligram per day respectively. So here are the sources, uh, sources that is uh, uh, 
almost all the berries usually they have the bioactive compounds so along with that the promogranate the grapes and also the freeze dried uh, strawberries also they uh, they usually contains 200 to 1000 mg per 100 g of this bioactive compounds so omega 3 fatty acid so this is the major everyone catchy uh, fatty acid because uh, we usually won't get uh, uh, the uh, uh, this is the one which we need to get from the diet itself so that's why everyone are focused on nowadays it is focusing on this omega 3 fatty acids so omega 3 fatty acids they have the series of alpha linolenic acid again they have the they derived into the eicosapentaenoic acid and the docosahexaenoic acids uh, and this omega 3 fatty acids uh, they have the mechanism in this uh, uh, reduction of this oxidative stress and also one of the animal study that has uh, showed that the uh, uh, the uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids they have reduced this oxidative stress mainly by down regulating this nicotinamide adenines few enzymes okay i mean to say in general to say that the few enzymes that are the uh, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate oxidase or the suppression of xanthinin um, oxidase pathways so that and also it uh, helps in activation of the antioxidant enzymes such as like superoxide dismutase or even in case we, if we take uh, the vitamin C also, that also it helps in activation of those uh, uh, vitamins and also the ends, uh, the superoxide dis antioxidants agents. And also, if we come to the alpha linolenic acid, uh, we have got uh, that's that's what EPA that is the eicosapentaenoic acid and the docosahexaenoic acid. They are further metabolized into the various bioactive compounds like oxylipins. So this, they have the number, of, uh, they have uh, uh, plenty of the biological activities in mainly in the vessel walls. So one is it acts as an anti-inflammatory vasodilation, again, the endothelial functions, and also sometimes it improves the lipid profile as well. So that overall, it helps in uh, maintaining the vascular health. Next. So in addition to these antioxidant effects of this uh, omega-3 fatty acids, so the, as these are the fatty acids, they are incorporated into the phospholipid bilayer of the cell membranes. And there they have the effect that modulate the, uh, they have the wide range of cellular functions, including that of the ion channels and the receptors. For example, in the blood vessels, this uh, particularly this docosahexaenoic acid that modulates the calcium signaling, mainly to uh, for this uh, vascular smooth muscle cells, so that enhancing the vasodilation. And where in case of the kidney, uh, the eicosapentaenoic has acid that regulates the epithelial sodium channels that leading to an enhan enhanced, sorry, enhanced sodium excretion. So, however, both of the, uh, however, both of these the effects, say, similar effects uh, achieved by the calcium channel blockers where the, uh, and the diuretics, they are the drugs. So that we can clearly notice that even what the, uh, the drugs does the, those effects have we can create it by uh, uh, taking these uh, foods okay so and also one of the uh, um, uh, research article done by the goa and their uh, co-workers they have concluded that the provision of this eicosapentaenoic acid and the docosahexaenoic acid that leads to an, a significant reduction in the systolic and the diastolic blood pressures in the subjects uh, which are having uh, the higher risk, which are uh, who are in the higher risk of this cardiovascular disease. Next. So coming to the re recommendation and the food sources. So um, Zhang and the co-workers, they have uh, done an uh, re um, dose response meta-analysis that has demonstrated that the optimal combined intake of this omega-3 fatty acids for this uh, lowering HC uh, blood pressure is in between 2 gram uh, per uh, two gram per day and the three gram per day, uh, it's in between that. And uh, doses of this omega three fatty acids above the recommended that is three gram per day uh, is, is associated with additional benefits lowering this uh, uh, blood pressure among the groups which are having the higher risk for the cardiovascular disease. Supplemented for only ten weeks, whereas the FDA has recommended daily intake should not exceed three grams per day of this both. Uh, this eicosapentaenoic acid and the docosahexaenoic acid combined. So where with uh, uh, no more than two grams per day, uh, uh, which are also, which is, uh, should derive from the supplements, that's it. So if we come to the sources, uh, we have got 
the walnuts, flax seeds, chia seeds, the hemp seeds. We have, I have got a clear uh, one. To Next slide. A beautiful, uh, this one. Uh, here we can see this uh, uh, flax seeds. The tablespoon of uh, flax seed, it contains 2.4 grams of omega-3 ac uh, fatty acids. Whereas chia, it kind of one ounce, okay? Uh, that contains a five gram of uh, omega-3 fatty acids per serving. So like this. Uh, so by looking into this, again, we need to make wise uh, choices uh, how to uh, take these uh, omega-3 fatty acids uh, in while making our food, food plates. So coming to the omega-6 uh, fatty acids, so this is on the other part of this omega-3 fatty acids, that is the omega-6 fatty acids, that is the linoleic acid, that is the precursor of an arachidonic acid, which is consequently have the pro-inflammatory eicosanoids. This is, uh, it means uh, they promote the inflammation in the body. Usually we know that the inflammation occurs naturally, uh, that whenever we get the injuries or the infections, but the excessive or the chronic inflammation that is will be the harmful. That's why uh, we should make the balance of this uh, omega-3 and the omega-6 fatty acids so that uh, this uh, crucial for maintaining uh, the balanced inflammatory response as well. So the ome in, uh, you, this omega-6 fatty acids actually doesn't uh, directly uh, have the uh, or any association with this uh, uh, or blood pressure. But slightly, few of the studies they have shown that slightly it lowers the risk of developing the high blood pressure when we combine or we take it in a good ratio, omega-3 and omega-6. So, however, they didn't find a uh, previous one. So, however, we didn't even that we didn't get a clear uh, cut connection between this omega-6 specific uh, in blood pressure readings. So while uh, these fats uh, might have some protective uh, effects against this hypotension. So, but the levels of consumption is much, uh, because uh, why this omega-6 uh, doesn't have the direct effects on hypertension is also because they cannot be studied or as a drugs or the supplements. So because uh, the levels of the consumption of this omega-6 is uh, much higher than that of the omega-3. So that's why we, can just uh, take out from the data and the observational studies on this next slide and by the observational studies uh, they have uh, they have given uh, how much of the amount we need to take uh, so uh, these are the sources first uh, that is uh, usually uh, most of the vegetable oils they have the uh, sources of this uh, omega 6 fatty acids like the safflower sunflower oil corn oil soybean oil sunflower oil yeah, uh, that's why uh, even uh, the ICMR, that's the NI, the recommendation, they say that we in our daily life also, we need to change our cooking oils uh, monthly or uh, three months, uh, three months once. So that we get this omega-6 fatty acids but through these all vegetable oils. So the nutrition guidelines calls for an, uh, consuming the unsaturated fats like a Omega six fatty, uh, omega six fats in place of saturated fats. At that uh, fat, so the American Heart Association, along with the Institute of Medicine, they recommends uh, so getting five to ten percent of our daily calories. It should be from the omega six fats. Uh, for some, uh, the one who takes a two thousand calories a day, then it's accounts to eleven to twenty two grams of this omega six fatty acids. So how we can do is one is like salad dressing can be made with one tablespoon of uh, safflower oils that gives nine grams and one ounce of the sunflower seeds it gives a nine grams and also the walnut gives excuse one ounce of walnuts gives 11 grams so the recommending levels of the diverse uh, by that my plate of the day uh, mainly is to meet the required amounts of uh, 6.6 .6 grams of uh, um, omega-6 fatty acids and we need to meet 2.2 grams of omega-3 fatty acids for uh, our overall essential functions in the body. So, but unfortunately in the American, uh, each, uh, they have uh, much higher intakes. It's nearly about 10 times more. And also the low intake of omega-3 fatty acids, that is not good for the cardiovascular. So bringing 
the two into the better balance is a good idea. That is omega-3 and the omega-6 fatty acid. So it is recommended that the ratio of omega-6 is to omega-3. It should be 5 is to 1. Thank you. And generally, uh, the, com uh, the components, if we uh, generalize uh, means or summarize it, we need to adapt a diet which are rich in the predominant or the predominant plant-based one so that it includes all the components and have the potential effects in uh, helping or reducing this blood pressure. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Sindhuramam can take over the conclusion part. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Pritham. So uh, as uh, Dr. Pritham has suggested, uh, what are the different components that we have to be including and why uh, different uh, plant-based food products are helping in reducing the blood pressure. Just to summarize, so a uh, final takeaway, what we have to take from this particular representation is that we need to be including a good amount of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, nuts and seeds predominantly. Again, when we say nuts and seeds, it's not like overconsumption also we should not be doing. We should be sticking with at least one serving, which is around 20 to 30 grams of nuts and seeds serving per day, which is definitely going to give us a good amount of omega-3 and omega-6. And again, just to get the omega-6, we should not be uh, intaking too much amount of uh, edible oils also. Uh, when again, we have to say... Uh, what, whatever the type of edible oil you want to consume, basically we have to be focusing on uh, cold pressed or wood pressed, but not the refined oils. And specifically, we have to be focusing on getting a good amount of vitamin C, including vitamin C rich fruits and vegetables as well. And um, yeah, so uh, coming to the uh, summary of this uh, conclusion of this particular study, the data discussed in the systematic review allows to conclude that plant-based diets are associated with lower BP and overall better health outcomes when compared with animal-based diets. So we also stress the need to look at human health as closely intertwined with planetary health as it is necessary to consider the overall environmental pressure of food production. So in general, animal-based diets have a greater impact than plant-based ones for this reason. Uh, the, as a result, the latter should be promoted in a one health framework. So there's not just consuming plant-based diet is important, but as I've already mentioned, we need to be focusing on a nutritional balanced plant-based diet. For example, if you take a French fries, that is also a plant-based diet, but that's not a healthy full plant-based diet. Right? So we need to be, we need to try to include a healthy full and a nutritionally balanced plant-based diet, which is going to be the key for our cardiometabolic health. And not only that, plant-based diets are definitely a sustainable option. They're cost-effective and they're also low-risk solution that targets multiple chronic diseases simultaneously as well. So again, uh, as American Heart Association also suggests this particular, uh, I think this image sums it up everything because uh, food is the main medicine. When we consume the right amount of food and health, we can actually prevent the chronic diseases and, uh, and we don't have to uh, depend on the sick care, which is going to be the medication or the health management. So in short, if I have to say, we are what we eat. So we need to be choosing our um, choices more consciously and wisely. And we have to be more mindful on what we eat and how much we eat is also very, very important. So the quality and the quantity of the food that is going on to our meal plate is very, very important. And these are some of the uh, uh, images just to show you how we can include the uh, uh, whole food plant-based diet in our Indian scenario. Beautiful uh, meal plate samples here. And there's also one case study uh, where uh, a 43-year-old female came up with a hypertension and wasn't taking medication. And the patient used to consume omnivorous diet with having meat once a week and like two times per week. And patient was relatively physically inactive as well. So if we see on examination, when she approached her weight is 72 kgs, um, height is 155, heart rate is 102 and BP is 176 by 92. And uh, we can see the total cholesterol levels are high, LDL cholesterol levels are also high, HDL is uh, comparatively low and triglycerides are also high and when started on ARB along with the uh, you know lifestyle interventions specifically we asked her to reduce the intake of animal products to once a month and increase the intake of whole food plant-based diet so we can see at the follow-up uh, follow visit at four weeks and 12 weeks automatically um, the blood pressure uh, reduced uh, to 140 by 86 and at 12 weeks it came down to 118 by 76 and even the total cholesterol levels LDL and triglycerides that were also considerably reduced. So from this, we can say definitely the uh, consumption
consumption of a nutritionally balanced, healthy, full plant-based diet definitely helps in not improving or not reducing just blood pressure, but a lot of cardio metabolic parameters as well. And not only that, a plant-based diet is not, again, I, I would just uh, uh, love to emphasize on this slide once, once again, is plant-based diet is not only heart healthy, but it's also planetary healthy because it not only reduces our uh, risk of type 2 diabetes or cardiovascular diseases, or it helps in reducing our scope of obesity or risk of obesity, reduce the blood pressure and our LDL cholesterol levels also. And not only that, when we consume plant-based diet, we are responsible citizens where we can reduce the emission of greenhouse gases as well. Um, we can also help in reduce the fresh water usage and reduce the water pollution and reduce the land usage, which is going to make um, the planet much more sustainable and we can give a better planet to our future generations as well as a responsible citizens. So uh, this concludes my um, uh, this concludes our study. Thank you so much for being here and uh, patiently listening to our study. I hope you really enjoyed and got some beautiful insights from this uh, study. So any questions, Dr. Nitesh will be taking it up and uh, he'll be doing the vote of thanks as well. Thank you so much, everyone. Yes, Dr. Nitesh, you can take over. Any questions, please, you can drop it in the chat box. Do let us know how insightful you felt about uh, this particular uh, uh, journal club session. Uh, did you find it interesting? Please do let us know so that we can uh, improve ourselves in our future journal clubs as well. I think Dr. Nitesh, you can uh, do the vote of thanks. Thank you for giving me this uh, beautiful opportunity to express my gratitude to all this. You're not audible? Hello? Am I audible? Uh, very low. Your voice is very low. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Suprajam. And thank you so much. Now, ma'am? Yes, Hello? yes, it's better. Oh, okay, okay. Right. Thank you, Mama. Thank you, ma'am, for uh, giving this opportunity to me to express my gratitude towards all the delegates uh, who made this event possible. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Rajina, ma'am, and also all the committee members and advisors for providing us this uh, platform. And also, I would like to uh, thank you too. Uh, the president of uh, Pan uh, India Journal Club, Dr. Sindhura Man, for guiding us uh, through throughout all this process. Uh, now I would also like to thank uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Dikha Man, Dr. Nilinda Man, and uh, Dr. Pritham Man, uh, for their uh, efforts and uh, their enthusiasm. And uh, last but not Please, I would also like to thank uh, all uh, our uh, audiences uh, for uh, showing uh, trust in us and, uh, and making this uh, um, event successful. And uh, in last uh, once and all, uh, I would like to thank all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nitesh. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, Dr. Smita, Malini, uh, uh, Dr. Sabina, Dr. Supraja, Dr. Gayatri Devi, thank you so much everyone for taking time out of your busy schedules and attending and attending our journal club. Thank you so much. So we'll come uh, we'll come back with a very good and an, another interesting journal club session in the next month. And thank you so much. Take care. Good night. Bye bye.